أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل لا ومن يدلل فلا هادي لا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك لا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والإرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل بدعة ضلالة وبعد يقول الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وجعلنا بعدكم لبعد فتنة أتصبر أتصبرون وكان ربك بصيرا الله سبحانه وتعالى says in his noble book and we have made some of you as trials for others. Will you have patience? And indeed your Lord is ever seeing, Al-Basir. It is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation of human beings that he has made each of us a test or a trial for someone else. That he has made each and every individual a test for their counterpart. So the believer is a test for the unbeliever. And the rich is a test for the poor. And the ignorant are a test for the wise. And the hypocrites are a test for those who are sincere. And the liars are a test for those who are truthful. And men are a test for women. And children are a test for their parents. And vice versa. Therefore, each and every human being is a test for someone else. Somebody who is healthy may look at the person who has health, who is uh, sickly. Uh, and become arrogant. Somebody who has money may look at the poor person and become arrogant, have kibr. The sick person may look at the rich person and say, Ya Allah, how come you didn't create me with money? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there's hikmah in each and every way that he created each and every person. There's hikmah in each and every way that he distributed his sustenance. 
that there are some people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he only gave them money because if he didn't give them money they would never worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are some people who the Prophet says that if Allah ta'ala gave them money they would never worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you may look at your financial situation and say I have all of the brilliance I have all of the intelligence I have, I have all of the resources to be a multi-billionaire I'm a trillionaire in terms of my talents but I just haven't reached that level as, a, as Christians say I'm anointed but not yet appointed <laughs> and the reality is that perhaps that if Allah Ta'ala were to give you what you're asking for it would destroy you like the, the cousin of Musa alayhi salam asked Musa alayhi salam to yeah, please make dua to Allah for me to have wealth and Musa alayhi salam told him, listen, if, you, if, you, if, I, if, if Allah ta'ala gives you what you're asking for, it may be your very destruction. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to engage in righteous activity. And when he was given wealth, surely enough he became arrogant. So much so that Allah ta'ala caused the earth to swallow him. There are some people whom Allah ta'ala keeps sick because in their sickness they have humility. But the moment your health is better, you start to use your health to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he keeps them ignorant. Because the moment they have knowledge, they become arrogant. And use their knowledge as a means to, to, to belittle people and humiliate others. So your maqam, your level, the st status that Allah ta'ala puts you on, if he loves you, it's according to what's inside of you. So don't look at anybody else and say, why him and not me? No, Allah Ta'ala has hikmah in everything he does. Allah Ta'ala has wisdom in each and every risk, sustenance that he has given us. So the Prophet used to teach his companions that if you, have, if you see somebody that has more mal or jamal than you, if you see somebody that has more beauty than you, then look at somebody that's uglier than you, in my own speech. Or less beautiful would be more appropriate than you. Say, so I might be ugly, but brother right there, he got a face for a uh, uh, radio. All right? Just to put things in the context. If you see somebody that has more money than you, look at somebody that's poorer than you. It will put things in the context. If you have poor health, there's always somebody that has worse health than you. And actually, while I tell you, say, I might have it bad, but it can always be worse. And the, 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 the remedy for that is to travel to go to different places and countries, go to third world countries where people are literally making dua to be in your place. The problems that you have, wallahi, there's somebody in this world that's asking Allah, begging Allah for the kind of problems that we got. Praying to Allah, I wish I had the kind of problems that they have, it would be a blessing in my life. If I had a job to complain about, if I had a house to complain about, if I had a wife, if I had children to complain about, it would be a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they don't have it. So on authority of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, <coughs> they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, balan? That who are the people that have it the most difficult in this life? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that they are the Anbiya, Thumma Salihun. He said the people that have the hardest, the most difficult lives are the Prophets and the Messengers. And after them are the Salihun, the, the righteous people, right? So the more righteous you are, the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greater the test is going to be for you. And he said that the greatest test that the human beings have, that people have, are other people. So the title of the khutbah today is, Do not let people be the reason you don't enter paradise. Don't let people be the cause for you not to enter paradise. Don't let people be the cause for you not to enter paradise. What a shame it would be to show up to the Day of Judgment, stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after uh, having fasted and having prayed and have, uh, giving sadaqah and doing all of these things and to not enter paradise because you're wrong one of Allah's creation. One of the students, he asked the teacher, he said, Ya Shaykh, could you please give me some nasiha? And he said, do not let anybody, do not ever be a cause for someone to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let anybody complain to Allah about you. That's the best advice that I can give you. So going back to these prophets and messengers, as it says in the Quran, wa kana insanu dhuluman juhula, that Allah ta'ala, that human beings were created oppressive and ignorant by nature. Except that when they receive enlightenment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that their circumstance changes. So it says in uh, Surah Al-Nas, 
الناس, one of the, the Muawidatain, one of the prayers that we are taught to seek protection is to seek protection from people. الناس, seek uh, protection from the, the creator of Nas, Ilahi Nas, from the God of Nas, من شر الوسواس الخناس, from the shar, from the evil of human beings. Ask Allah to help you from the evil of human beings. The people that whisper, the people that backbite and talk, that's always in your ear talking. Nonsense, ignorance. You have a focus, you have a goal in life, and somebody will come. They say one of the, the quickest way to kill a dream is to introduce it to a small mind. Brother, you can't do that. You're not good enough to do You're not talented enough to do that. Or they uh, your, your, your ideas, they, 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 they make your, your vision small. Oh, I see you started your little business. Oh, I see you finished that little PhD that you was doing. Oh, I see you, mem you, you memorized that little Sora. The quickest way to kill a big dream is to introduce it to a small mind. And then he says, So this is to seek our protection from shaitan, from the shayateen. But Allah Ta'ala is telling us that shayateen is not just from the jinn. Many of us think of, of jinn as like this unseen, ghostly, things that's hit hot in, 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 in the room or under their bed or somewhere like that, or in the basement somewhere. But the reality is there are jinn from mankind, there are shayateen, rather, from mankind. And the ulama of Tazkiyah, they say that the jinn from human beings are even worse than the jinn from the shayateen. Because we have the medicine for the jinn from the shayateen. You can recite uh, ayat al-kursi, you can recite the adhan, and they go running. When you hear the call for adhan, when you hear Qur'an, when you hear Surah Al-Baqarah, out the door, they're running for their lives. But the jinn from the human beings, you may be reciting Qur'an and they will finish the ayah for you. You are praying in salah and they are praying beside you. Some of us, they are in our bedroom, in our houses. Some of them are from amongst our children. That some of your wives and your children are fitness, so be aware of them. You should be fearful of them. This is the dua they used to make. Oh Allah, make from our wives and our offspring a coolness of our eyes. And ulama, one of the scholars, he said, when we say kurratu ayun, a coolness of our eyes, we're not talking about man or jam, you know, like that they are beautiful. Rather, wala yajuruna alayna jara'ir, that they don't lead us to committing crimes. Sometimes your children can be so horrible, so awful, that you question Allah, Allah, why me? I pray all of my prayers, I give all of my zakat, I give sadaqah, I do everything that you require me to do. Why is my child so horrible, ya Allah? Why am I being tested? Oh, I'm, a, I'm a good man or I'm a good woman. Why is my husband so awful, so abusive, so, so ignorant? So sometimes because of that, you will begin to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will put you in trouble. Look at Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. After giving da'wah for 950 years, Allah ta'ala promised him that he would save his family. He gets on a boat and his son is missing. He says, I'm going to go to the mountain now and save myself. Nuh alayhi salam asked Allah, Ya Allah, you promised me that you would save my family. Ya Nuh, innahu laysa min ahlik. He's not from your family. Don't ask me about these things lest you find yourself in a bad position. And he checked himself, he corrected himself. But out of his love for his child, he, he questioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fitna, a trial, tribulation. You look at Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas, he says in his tafsir, of this ayah, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً That the believers are, are brothers for one another. He said, not all brothers are the same. He said, yeah, the believers are brothers, but not all brothers are the same. He said, you have brothers like Musa, uh, like uh, Harun, the Aaron was to Moses, or Harun was to Musa, alayhi salam, and you have brothers like the brothers of Yusuf, alayhi salam. Not all brothers are the same. Some brothers want to help you in the path of Allah, and some brothers will leave you for dead in a well. Not all brothers are the same. You look at Imam Bukhari, uh, the, the, the famous collector of the Sahih Bukhari. The reason why he died was from he was being persecuted by people. They, they became jealous of Imam Bukhari. That he would, go to play, he would go to a town and all of the students of all the scholars, they would leave. Scholars would come to their classes and they would find no students. So they begin to make up lies about Imam Bukhari. They say he was a, a mutadid. That he would say things that, was, that he was uh, heretical. 
to the point that it made Imam Bukhari so sad. The things that the people were saying about him, they asked Allah to take his life. He said, Allah, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. You have never been hurt until you have been hurt by someone that you're trying to help. It killed him inside. Here I am, I've dedicated my entire life to preserving this deen. And now people are lying on me, telling other people, don't sit in the gathering of Bukhari. He's misguiding people. He's lying on the Prophet Wasallam. He said, oh Allah, I don't want to be here amongst these people anymore. This like Nuh salam, when Allah gave him his dua, he said, oh Allah, wipe them off from the face of earth. Don't leave a single one of them on earth. I'm tired of these people. So the reality is that human beings are the greatest test of, of people. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We look at all these different individuals. There was an individual by the name of Zayd al-Abidin. He was the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu And he witnessed in his time all of the members. I'm not sure if many of us are aware of this happening called Karbala, where all of the members of the Prophet Sallallahu his, his household, they were killed, they were slaughtered by other Muslims. And the only one that remained from Karbala was Zayn al-Abidin, was this servant. So he used to cry and he would weep and he would weep and he would weep and people would ask him, why are you always crying? And Tabuka, why was he said, I witnessed all of the slaughtering of all of my family members. How can, I cry, how can I not cry when I remember such an event? So people would come and they would dis disturb Zayn al-Abidin on one occasion and he was known as uh, Zayn al-Abidin because he was a great worshiper. Sometimes they say he would sit in one uh, pr uh, place and he would make a thousand rakah. In one place, that was, that was his thing. He was a, a, a devout worshiper. He never bothered anyone. So he comes outside of the masjid out of, uh, 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 after praying and making dua. And uh, Zayn al-Abidin, it means like the beauty of the worshipers. So somebody said, are you the one that they call Zayn al-Abidin? He said, naam, I'm the one. He said, enta Shayn al-Abidin. And Shayn in Arabic language, it means like you're the worst, like you're the, the, uh, the worst. You're the disgrace of the worshipers. So people around him like, yo, how can you talk to the grandson of the Prophet or something like this? And he said, leave him, let him finish. So he cursed Zayn al-Abidin from A to Z. And to jahil, and to, you know, just, you're ignorant, you're a fasic, you're this and that. And he just let him talk. And he said, after he finished, he smiled at this man. And he said, if, if, if he said, I thank you for giving me this kind of advice. Because everything that you said about me is true. Everything that you said about me is true. I can, I can find some, some way to, uh, or to justify everything that you said about me. Other people may call me Zain al Abidin, but me, I find myself that I have deficiencies. So thank you. How can I give you a gift to repay me for this sincere advice that you have given me? And the man says, Subhanallah, Ashadu anna ka ibn Rasulullah. He said, I, I, I bear witness that you are the son of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because only people like you have this kind of akhlaq. And he said, the only reason I did this is because somebody paid me money to come and, and make you upset. And Zayn al-Abidin said, if you would have just come to me, I would have gave you the money for free. <laughs> you didn't have to come and disgrace me like this. I just gave it to you. <laughs> All right? And another occasion, the uh, Hisham, who was the brother of the Khalifa at the time, he was making Hajj. And sometimes, wallahi, the greatest fitna is Hasad. That could be a whole other khutbah about envy, about the evil eye. Uh, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that one third of my ummah will die from the evil eye. That will die as a result of the evil eye. So here Zayn al-Abidin, Hisham ibn, uh, ibn Abdul Malik was making Hajj and he had this big uh, vanguard of security guards and people following him and, and all these people going around the, the Kaaba. He's trying to get to the Black Stone. But because he has this big uh, you know, group of people, he couldn't make it to the Black Stone. And for those of you that make Hajj or Umrah, you know it's very difficult to make it to the Black Stone. You have to like, you know, it's almost like martial arts lessons in there, right? You have to do jujitsu and every type of taekwondo, you know, just to get to the black stone, which you shouldn't do anyway. The nature of it is this sunnah, but if you can't make it, it's fine. You can just wave to it. But anyway, Hisham is just struggling to get to the Kaaba, to the black stone, and he's the brother of the Khalifa. He's like this major person. So then here comes Zayn al-Abidin. He's walking towards the Kaaba, and as he's walking, everybody departs. It's like the sea splits in half from him. He's walking, bikullu hudu, like with all this grace, Sakina, he's walking and everybody parts and he goes up to the black stone, he kisses it by himself. So now here's the brother of the Khalifa, he's embarrassed, so his people were asking him, yo, who's that? And he was like, la nadifuhu, we don't know, we don't, we don't know him. Essentially, like, he's nobody. 
So at the time, there was a poet by the name of Farazdaq, and this is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When people seem to uh, try to disgrace you or humiliate you, don't defend yourself. Don't go, don't engage in a back and forth with them because it will only humiliate you. <laughs> Let other people defend you on your behalf. The best way to deal with an ignorant person is silence. So at the time, it just happened to be a poet by the name of Farazdaq who was there. And he says, if you don't know him, I know him. And he wrote this qasida, this beautiful poem. He said, هذا الذي تعرفه والبتاء وتأته والبيت يعرفه والحل والحرم هذا ابن خير عباد الله كلهم هذا تقي نقي خير هذا تقي نقي طاهر العالم هذا ابن ابن فاطمة إن كنت جاهله right he wrote this long cause this beautiful poem and everybody like started to recite the poem and memorize the poem on the spot so uh, all around the Kaaba everybody began to hear this poem. So this guy was so embarrassed, he ordered the people to lock this guy Farazdaq up, put him in jail for the poem that he wrote. <laughs> so when Zain al-Abidin heard about this poem, he, he uh, sent him a hundred thousand dinar to the poet, and the poet gave it back. He said, Wallahi, the only reason I said this was out of anger, out of anger for them disrespecting you. I didn't say it out for money. And Zain al-Abidin sent it back, and he said that if you know that, uh, that Allah Ta'ala bore witness that you love Ahl al-Bayt, so if you know that we are from the family of the Prophet you don't reject the gift that we have given you, so take it. And this poem for the ages, it lives on. He became famous because of this poem, and he sham up until the day people are, 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 are reciting the story because he tried to disgrace this righteous man. We don't know who he is. So the idea is that people are going to be a fitna for you. Whether it be your children, whether it be your spouses, whether it be the people that you work with, whether it be members in your community, they're going to be a great trial and tribulation for you. And the question is, how are we going to handle this fitna? Are we going to allow it to be a means for us to enter paradise or the cause for us to enter, enter the hellfire? Wala'adhu billahi ta'ala kullu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي علمنا من العلوم ما به كلفنا صلى وسلم على محمد وآله وصحبه والمقتد وبعد The Prophet was sitting with his companions one day and he said to them look at the door يطلو عليكم رجل من أهل الجنة He says look at the, the entrance there's going to enter somebody from the people of paradise. Nah. So here comes this individual walking. His hair is disheveled. He doesn't look like anything special, seemingly. The second day, the Prophet ﷺ said the same thing. That a person from the people of paradise are going to come in the door. The third day, the same thing. So one of the companions, he went and he followed this individual to his house. He said to him, you know, I had a dispute with my uh, family member and I vowed that I wouldn't go stay with them. Can I stay with you? So he said he stayed with this man and he didn't, he, he, he watched him at nighttime. He didn't do a lot of tahajjud. He didn't pray a lot at nighttime. And he didn't do anything special. You know, he wasn't given a lot of charity or anything like that. So after the third day, he said, I stayed with you and I'm trying to figure out what makes you a person of paradise. What makes you so special? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you are a man of paradise. And he said, I don't do anything special. He said, everything that you've seen from me is as it is. I'm not anything special. Except that one thing. He said that I don't go to bed at night hating any of the Muslims in my heart. He said, when I go to bed at night, I forgive each and every single person from amongst the Muslims. Regardless of what they did to me. Regardless of even if they asked for a forgiveness, I forgive them. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there are two people, two brothers and two sisters that they, Allah, they will, Allah Ta'ala would not forgive them, would not allow them to enter paradise until they forgive each other. Two believers that have grudges in their hearts for one another, that have enmity, that have hatred, and they will be banned from paradise if they do not rectify their affairs. He says that I go to bed at night and I forgive all of the believers if they asked me or they didn't ask me. And he said, I don't have hasad, I don't have any envy for anyone else. I love to see it, as they say, when my brother is winning. I love to see it when my sister is winning. 
I love to see my brother getting money. I love to see my sister getting money. I love to see when my brother finds a good wife. I love to see when my uh, sister finds a good husband. I love to see my brothers and sisters increasing. I don't have envy for them. I say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. I make dua for Allah Ta'ala to increase them in that. I love to see my brothers and sisters increasing in knowledge. He says that when I go to bed at night that my heart is pure. And something that we should know is that many people think that you can hurt people and you can deceive people and you can backbite people and then you can go and make tawbah and it will be forgiven. But that's not the case. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Let me tell you something now. If you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you, for example, are lax a days ago in your prayer, or you committed some sin that is between you and Allah, you can go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, enter ghafur rahim, please forgive me. But if you harm a human being, if you take somebody else's right, you cannot just make tawbah and say, I did this, we're done. You have to go to that individual and rectify the affair. You can't steal money from somebody and say, Allah, please forgive me, I stole from my brother. You have to go and give that brother his money back and ask for forgiveness and then ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive you. And if you don't, Billahi, you're going to talk to Allah about it on the Day of Judgment. There's no way to get around it. If you backbit somebody, you have to go to that person and tell them, I backbit you. I slandered you. Forgive me. And if you don't, you're going to answer to Allah Ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. That's why Imam Ahmad, whenever somebody would backbite him, he would send them fruit. Say, thank you, because I know on the day of judgment, you're going to run them deeds. I need that. I need all of that. So keep on talking about me. So the idea is, don't let people be the cause for you not to enter paradise. On the day of judgment, before any individuals entered into paradise, they're going to be asked about their affairs, how they dealt with people. How did you deal with other people? How did you deal with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As the Prophet Sallallahu says that whoever does not have mercy on mankind, Allah Ta'ala would not have mercy on them. So do not let people be the cause for you not to enter paradise. Don't be having to stand around on the day of judgment and, and deal with the hisab about people that you mistreated, money that you owe people, you know, people that you didn't deal with correctly and they're complaining to Allah Ta'ala about you. And you have to wait to deal with all of these people before you enter paradise. There's some people that have so many mountains of deeds, but because of what they did to people, people will come and collect their deeds. Come and collect their deeds until they have nothing left, and they will be thrown in the hellfire. So the idea for this is the answer Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran is Ibadur Rahman Alladina Yamshuna Al Arhuna. He says that the Ibadur Rahman, that the worshippers of Ar Rahman are those who uh, walk the earth in all of humility. That when they're walking, they have humility and they have, metaphorically, uh, they have balance in their lives. Huh? That you don't find them walking arrogantly. You can tell a lot about a person by how they, just how they walk. How they, when, they, when they walk, when they approach people. Are they approachable? Do they have a sense of air? That they're better than people? And then when the ignorant call out to them, when the ignorant debate them, people talk to them crazy on Facebook and on Instagram, whatever the case may be, uh, salama. They just say peace be unto you. They don't wish them any ill. They don't argue back and forth with them. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I guarantee a house in paradise for anybody that leaves off argument even when they are right. Guarantee a house in paradise. That when the ignorant people mistreat them or deal with them incorrectly, say peace unto you. I don't even want no problem with you. Peace. You deal with your issue. But I'm, you're not going to be the cause for me not to enter paradise. And in another ayah in, in, in the Quran, we close off with this, where Allah Ta'ala gives the remedy, Allah Ta'ala swore by time that all of mankind is at loss, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَامِلُوا صَالِحَانَ Except those who believe and do righteous, engage in righteous activity, وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْصَبْرِ So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says that the believer that, uh, that stays in the community. You know, sometimes people get on your nerves so bad that you don't even want to come to the masjid no more. All right? As one of the non-Muslims said, I think Allah that I met, uh, that I found Islam before I found Muslims. <laughs> because if I would have found Muslims before I found Islam, I would have never been Muslim. So the believers are fitna. Sometimes there's so much fitna in the community, you don't even want to go to the masjid no more. You want to pray at home with your family. 
But the Prophet ﷺ said, it is better for the believer to stay with the people even if it causes them harm. It is better if you can rectify the affairs, if you can advise them and be patient and correct their, their affairs. It's better to stay with them. And if you can't, it's better for you to stay away from them. But you get more reward if you stay in the community and deal with all the, the heartache and the hardship of the community and, and make it better than to just leave them on their own. It's better for you. So he says, uh, Those that speak the truth and those that you know, are, are dealing with people with patience. So this is the sunnah of our, of our ummah, that we deal with each other with patience, that we remind those of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we remind those of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we try not to be a fitna for one another. Think like, I don't, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, help your brother against shaitan, don't help shaitan against your brother. Like, let's not be the reason that we're standing on the day of judgment and I did something to my brother or I hurt my sister in a way and, and we have the answer to Allah Ta'ala on the day of judgment. As, as it says in the Quran that you were on the harf of the hellfire and Allah Ta'ala alafa bayna kulubukum and Allah Ta'ala put love between your hearts. But if he did not put love between your hearts, you were standing on the brink of the hellfire. And some of us, were in that very state because of how we deal with people we wouldn't even know. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring to this ummah, to bring to this particular community, love. That he put between our hearts love and rahmah. That if there's anybody that harm you or hurt you or back bit you, that you forgive them. That if there's any brother or sister in the community that you have enmity, that you have grudges, that don't leave this masjid today except that you ask each other for forgiveness. That you pardon one another. That you overlook each other's faults. In the same way that you look, overlook your brother's fault and your sister's faults, Allah ta'ala will also overlook your fault. There's three types of mercy that's mentioned in the Quran. There's maqfira, there's afu, and there's rahma. And afu, uh, is the one that, that we ask Allah Ta'ala for, is to interact with somebody that hurts you in a way as if they never did it before. You know, some people say, I can forgive, but I won't forget. But it's to forgive and forget as if they never did it before. That's afu. That's what we ask for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. If you want that, to have that for your brother and your sister, bidillahi ta'ala. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَكِنَّا أَذَابَ النَّارِ رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَاءَ رَبَّنَا فِدْنِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ سُبْحَانَكَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى مُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah Ta'ala, we ask you to make us a people that love one another, that have peace between us, that do not have grudges and enmity amongst each other. We ask you to make us a people that uphold the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are people that are embodying the Quranic characteristics, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you to allow us to be people that forgive each other and that to remind one another of the Kitab and the Sunnah, to be one another that have uh, Muhammadian akhlaq, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rakeemu Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala al-falah, Qad qamati salatu, Qad qamati salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah, wa ahdu ala shirik ala shirik. Shall I go see? Okay, inshallah. Okay, bismillah. الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جاعل في الأرض خليفة قالوا أتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسبق دماء ونحن نسبح ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عر
وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يقل له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله اللهم انك سلام انك سمع انك بارك يا رب العالمين الله لا اله الا الله لا اله الا الله بسم الله السلام عليكم so alhamdulillah you should know uh, Ustad Youssef is pretty much finished with his uh, degree at Al-Azhar, inshallah. We congratulate him for that. Allahu Akbar. And you'll be seeing a lot more of him, inshallah. We're pushing him to be assisting with our youth director position and just uh, all of the cool stuff that Youssef Kroma does. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, we're, we're welcoming him home pretty much, inshallah. Uh, remember, today is First Friday. Green envelopes give more and more and more to Muhammad schools, inshallah. You can go directly to the table, Muhammad schools table, or specify that you're doing that when you're making that donation. Uh, remember, we do have the uh, property manager position. That's a paid position. You can email at Majlis Secretary uh, or secretary at atlantamasjid.com and then there's one more 
uh, that I have to read here. Uh, we know that our uh, sister Khadija Abdurrahman, who's in Fulton County, uh, she's running for the, uh, I'm not seeing the actual position here, uh, commissioner's office. What is it, Brother Daoud? Brother Daoud, Sharif. And she's re going up for her position. I think, it w uh, I think that's what it is. But it, uh, you'll see it in the announcements, inshallah. But make sure that uh, th there he is. Give me that announcement specifically. <laughs> She is the commissioner. She is the commissioner. And uh, she's the first African American. First African American, first female, first Muslim. And uh, they had a commission vote and they, and they left her out of the vote. Commission vote and they left her out of the vote, so we need to respond. We're responding to and the date of that is? The date of that is? The 7th of um, February at 11 o'clock. 7th of February at 11 o'clock, Fulton County. State House, inshallah. And, and the sister, she's done some great things for the community, so we want to make sure that we're supporting her uh, and the rest of the politicians that we have in our community, inshallah. May Allah accept our salat. Remember our vendors. Uh, remember to give some zakat and be with each other, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.